Hey guys, my name's Dale, this is Think Fact, and welcome to 10 Interesting Facts That Almost Nobody Knows. So, let's get started. Now, I don't know about you, but having my own personal private island getaway sounds pretty awesome. But nobody's yet to own a private island bigger than that of Louis Joliet. Joliet was born in 1645 near Quebec City, so this is an old record. He was one of the first Europeans to map out parts of the Mississippi River, and this, along with helping out map out the Hudson Bay for the French crown, the King of France of the time, Louis XIV, gifted Joliet with Anacosti Island. Located in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and being about 7,900 kilometers squared, the island is almost the same size as Crete, Greece, though a fair bit colder. Joliet moved his family and servants there shortly after acquiring it. And after his death in 1700, the island was divided amongst his sons who owned it until the island as a whole was ceded to Great Britain after the Seven Years' War, being annexed by Newfoundland and later acquired by Quebec. Today, Anacosti Island has a population of about 240 people, many of whom care for the lighthouses on the island because the place is notorious for shipwrecks, likely being what killed Joliet. Though no longer privately owned, its citizens are attempting to make the island a UNESCO World Heritage Site in order to preserve its environment. Most vertebrates like you, me, and this blue-footed booby have red blood. If you don't, you, uh, you might want to get that checked out, you know, sooner than later. Our blood is red because of the iron within hemoglobin, an oxygen transport metalloprotein within our red blood cells. And even when your blood is inside of you, it's still a red color, just a darker shade of red. But red blood is one of the few notable pigments blood has been found to exist in within nature. Five other notable ones being blue, purple, green, yellow, and brown. Blue blood is a result of hemocyanin, which uses copper. It's clear in the veins, but blue when oxygenated. It can be found in octopuses, squids, spiders, and crustaceans. Purple blood is a result of hemerythrin, which is clear in the veins, but purplish pink when oxygenated. It can be found in brachiopods, and most notably in specific marine worms, like peanut worms and penis worms. Don't draw attention to it. Green blood is a result of chlorocurin. It is green in the veins and a light reddish color when oxygenated. It can be found in annelids like earthworms and leeches, along with a few species of marine worms as well. There is also a unique species of lizard with green blood, known as the green-blooded skink, but its blood is green for different reasons. From here, the other two are a bit more mysterious. Yellow blood is found in animals with blood containing vanadium. Though blood containing vanadium can be green and sometimes an orangish red color, yellow blood can be found within select species of sea cucumbers, beetles, and sea squirts. And Lastly, brown blood is quite rare. It's a result of pinoglobin, which is magnesium-based, and it has thus far been found in particular species of mollusks in the genus Pinna, though not much is known about it. Did you know that the ceremonial peace hey, pipe- Dale. It's time. Jabril, what are you doing here? This is my video. I need you to include a fact. Can't do that right now. Dale, no, listen. Yes, you can, man. Make time for the meeting. Do you think we can get some spit from you, dude? Yeah. You want some spit facts, too? <laughs> I already did a fact about bottle of fluids. I can't do another one. Dale, come on, man. Please, do, do it for Michael. Fine, fine. I'll, I'll do it for Michael. And Guy, Guy Fieri. Fieri. Maybe that's one too many memes for today. Scientists have confirmed the hypothesis that saliva from grazing animals can actually stimulate plants to not only grow back what was lost due to consumption, but in many cases overcompensate and grow bigger. In a three-year study with multiple controls looking at Lamus chinensis, a wild species of rye, scientists investigated how it would react to being consumed by a flock of sheep. It was found that the plant species was actually stimulated to grow as a result of components in the saliva. Further mentioning, animal saliva significantly significantly increased tiller number, the number of buds, and biomass. However, there was no effect on height. There seems to be a sweet spot in terms of how much is needed to be consumed. Too much or too little will not give the same results. They concluded with, the results demonstrated a link between saliva and the mobilization of carbohydrates following herbivory, which is an important advance in our understanding of the evolution of plant responses to herbivory. More studies need to be done in terms of which plants and animal saliva this works with. But if you're interested in learning more over this, the journal is within the description as are the sources for everything. Did you know that the ceremonial peace pipe which can be found in select Native American societies and cultures, appears to have developed out of a weapon known as the atlatl. It's a shaft with a cup that allows for high-velocity spear throwing. 
Archaeological findings from the Hopewell Sphere of Influence that existed in pre-Columbian North America seems to show a gradual evolution within the Atlatl technology, particularly with the existence of banner stones. With the addition of these multi-purpose counterweights, they allowed for more artistic expression on the weapon's shaft, with particular ones having bowls carved out of the banner stones. For smoking tobacco, later atlatl shafts can be found to function almost exclusively as pipes, often with symbolic animals at the tip of them, acting as a bowl. This evidence has suggested to archaeologists that particular shafts were used almost exclusively for diplomatic and religious ceremonies, being an item that represented the possibility of war or peace. In some instances, different societies that use ceremonial peace pipes can be found making them out of local weapons in order to maintain that symbolic concept, like tomahawk ceremonial peace pipes. And as atlatls fell out of use for more efficient technologies like bows and later guns, it made this war-peace connection a little less visibly obvious. And though this is an ongoing investigation, such discoveries are helping uncover the context behind culturally significant items of native peoples. This is a photo of three-month-old Walding Kirch, a photo that so happens to be the very first digital photo ever. Walden's father, along with a team of constituents, invented the very first digital image scanner back in 1957. Being the same year this digital photo of Walden was created. Interestingly enough though, the poor quality of the photo was not actually a direct result of the scanner within itself, but rather a result of the computer the image was being scanned into not having enough storage space to store all the information that was scanned from Walden's photo. That said, it's still in much better condition than a number of JPEGs that I've seen online. This digital image scanning technology would go on to play a pivotal part in the success of future exploration, technology, and cultural achievements. Being a technology that played a critical part in the success of moon and space exploration by NASA in the 1960s, making medical technology such as the CAT scan possible in the 1970s, and enabling John and Thomas Knoll to create Photoshop in the 1980s. With this photo, Jennifer in Paradise being the very first digitally scanned photo to have been ever used in Photoshop. The extinction of animal species and subspecies has become a serious matter for concern in recent times. But for the first time in this planet's history, or so I'm going to assume, an animal species has actually gone extinct twice, both because of us. The first time because we were dumb, the second time because we were smart. This is because the Pyrenean ibex, an Iberian wild goat native to Spain, went extinct in the year 2000. So scientists saved the cells of the female specimen to later use to clone in 2003. The clone ended up living after it was born, but only for a few minutes. Technically making it the first instance an animal species has gone extinct twice. Or so I'm going to assume. Sadly though, we only have samples of that one individual for the entire species meaning we will have to breed the clone with other mountain goats that are capable of reproducing with it, or to alter the DNA to some extent to make sure that the clones wouldn't have issues reproducing with one another. The date is 1943, April 5th. The USS O'Bannon, an American destroyer, comes across a large stationary Japanese submarine on the surface of the water. With the intent of ramming it, the O'Bannon charges straight towards the sub, only to change her mind last second in case it contained mines, ending up right beside the sub. Close enough for the crew of the O'Bannon to notice Japanese sailors sleeping at the top of the sub. This calls for a dangerous situation, for the Japanese had three-inch deck guns ready to use, and the O'Bannon was too close to use her weapons. Suddenly, the Japanese sailors woke up and tried to make their way to the guns. Sailors on the O'Bannon quickly grabbed the closest things to them to throw. Potatoes. Yes, potatoes. There were barrels of this sophisticated ally technology simply sitting on the deck. And the sailors on the O'Bannon started chucking them at the submarine. In sheer panic, the Japanese sailors started throwing them back on the destroyer while at the same time fleeing into the submarine, abandoning the deck guns. Likely mistaking the potatoes for grenades in the heat of the moment. This gave the O'Bannon enough time to get some distance, firing at the Japanese sub and later dropping a depth charge, effectively destroying it. The conflict was a success thanks to the age-old potato grenade switcheroo. When news got back to the States, growers of the potatoes in the U.S. state of Maine created a plaque commemorating the moment, with the whole event later being known as the Maine Potato Episode where potatoes helped sink a Japanese submarine. The USS O'Bannon would go on to be the US Navy's most decorated destroyer in World War II. And yes, all of this is real, except the, ac <clears throat> except the accent. Often when it comes to exploring and understanding the cosmos, the average person really just takes into consideration what they can see and maybe think about things like temperature or touch. But with that being said, there are interesting components to celestial bodies that our own bodies can sense that don't often get taken into consideration. Two such ones being smell and sound. 
Interestingly enough, in our solar system alone, there are a number of moons, planets, and dwarf planets that actually have smells to them, with about all of them emitting signals that can be picked up upon and converted into sound for us to hear. Here are a few notable ones. Venus smells like rotten eggs, and it sounds like this. The moon smells like spent gunpowder, and it sounds like this. Jupiter has multiple layers with different layers having different smells. Its outermost layers smell like ammonia, its middle layers smell like rotten eggs, and its bottommost layers smell like almonds. Jupiter sounds like this. Saturn smells like ammonia, and it sounds like this. And lastly, Uranus, or Uranus, actually doesn't have much of a smell to it at all. Many of the chemicals within its atmosphere are scentless. Uranus sounds like this. The story of Adam Reiner is an interesting one. He's the only person in history to hold the title of being considered both medically a dwarf and a giant within his lifetime, though not at the same time. Born in 1899 within Austria, Adam's height would first be documented when he attempted to join the military at age 18 during World War I. At this point in his life, his height was recorded to be at 4 feet 6 inches, or about 1.38 meters, being roughly the same height as actor Peter Dinklage, a height that would prevent him from being allowed to join the military at the time. That said, it was noted that he had enormous hands and feet for his size, suggested to be early signs of the potential effects of gigantism, which later on would appear to be the case. By 1930, roughly 10 years later, he was 6 foot 9, or almost exactly 2 meters tall. Doctors at the time found he had a tumor in his brain, which was likely resulting in his growth. Due to that, he decided that he would undergo the operation that it would take to remove it. It was extremely risky, but he did manage to survive. But sadly, he continued to grow. The tumor wasn't completely removed, and it took a tremendous toll on his spine. Over the course of his life, which lasted all the way up to 1950, he would go on to grow to be a whopping 7 feet 10 inches or 2.38 meters. Though sadly again, towards the end of his life, he would end up going deaf in one ear, blind in one eye. He had extreme difficulties maintaining his appetite and would be bedridden for the few last years of his life. But his situation is a unique one when it comes to the tallest people who have ever lived, with Adam still holding a spot in the top 50 tallest people to have ever lived. And lastly, how much color we humans can see is actually a pretty fascinating topic. Visible light is simply a range of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that can stimulate our eyes. When taking into consideration the entire electromagnetic spectrum, everything from radio waves to gamma rays, what percentage does visible light actually make up of it all? Well, on a logarithmic scale of frequency, visible light is 2.3% of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, while on a linear scale, it is 0.0035%. What that means is what we see really isn't that much in terms of all of the frequencies that exist. But what we do see, fascinatingly enough, is fabricated by our brains, based upon stimulations our brain obtains from particular cones within our eyes. Most people have red, blue, and green cones, which is known as trichromacy, which enables the average human to see about 1 to 10 million different shades of colors. But in very rare instances, there are people with four types of cones within their eye that let them see into the ultraviolet spectrum, something that is known as tetrachromacy. This allows them to see about 100 times more colors than the average person with trichromacy. One of the most famous people with it, fittingly enough, is Australian painter Kinsetta Antico, who makes paintings that also contain colors that are in a spectrum that only she and other people like her can see. And for quite a while now, she's been helping scientists try to help better understand and recognize people with tetrachromacy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the video. The question I have for you guys is, which fact or facts did you find the most interesting? I personally like the ceremonial peace pipe, the battleship, and the color ones the most. But I did like them all a lot because that's why I picked them. And with all that said and done, my name's Dale, this is Thing Fact, and remember, never stop learning. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. That would really help me out. And feel free to check out some of my other videos over the facts and thoughts that almost everybody missed. 
Have a good one.